okay, cool, we have something, we have a tool in our tool belt that we already have in our respective hospitals. We don't have to order it, it doesn't cost, you know, $14,000. It's already sitting in our pharmacies. Well, why can't we use it in our patients today? Today, this title of this talk is rather long, but it's titled Blue and Red for methylene blue and hydroxocobalamin. The reason why it's blue and red is the color of the urine that people make when they receive these medications. So if you're going to remember something, just remember, remember the color of the urine. But I like to go down unconventional patterns to take care of unconventional practices, excuse me, to take care of patients who have septic shock because at the end of the day, what we're currently doing of giving patients fluids, antibiotics, norepinephrine, vasopressin, et cetera, still leads to high mortality rates. So we have to think outside the box for things that might be beneficial. So one in five people in the world die of sepsis. There's going to be a day where we're, where we're going to invent some sort of monoclonal antibody, but it's not going to be reasonable for people in the world, for that matter, that don't have the resources that we have. But even in the United States, 350,000 Americans die every year of sepsis. So we need to do better. We need to think outside the box. We need to come up with new strategies to take care of these patients. Because even on the best studies, like the PROMISE, PROCESS, or RISE trials, mortality was still between 20 to 40%. So we're losing a lot of patients to sepsis and septic shock, and we could hopefully do better with new strategies. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole pathophysiology of sepsis because everybody knows it's an overdrive of the immune system and overreaction, but at the end of the day, we have a creation of a lot of bad stuff. Interleukin, cytokines, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, all this stuff goes haywire, right? And that leads to an increase in the production of inducible um, nitric oxide synthase. That leads to an increase in nitric oxide that causes the vasodilation that we see in patients. That leads to an increase in soluble guanylocyclase. I know that's not how you wanted to start the morning listening to these enzymes because it's way too much, but this ends up increasing the production of cyclic GMP. Again, vasodilation in our patients. This is the whole dilatory perspective of septic shock that we see. But this is where methylene blue comes into play. And to be honest, to, we've been using methylene blue for a number of different pathologies for many years now. But methylene blue has actually been used for over 100 years. They actually used it for malaria back in the 1800s. The guy who created it won the Nobel Prize. This is all old stuff that we already know how it works and what it does. And what methylene blue does is that it knocks out the inducible nitric oxide synthase and it also knocks out the soluble guanylocyclase. So you might say, okay, cool, we have something, we have a tool in our tool belt that we already have in our respective hospitals. We don't have to order it, it doesn't cost, you know, $14,000, it's already sitting in our pharmacies. Well, why can't we use it in our patients today? And we need to stop before we go ahead and use this because it does have some side effects that before we talk about the benefits, we need to consider what medications the patient's already on because we could actually cause more harm. This is one of the reasons why methylene blue is not recommended to use on everybody, but serotonin syndrome is very real. If you have a patient in whom you're considering giving them methylene blue, you need to make sure that they're not on some sort of SSRI, SNRI, because there is documented data as people developing serotonin syndrome, if they're, for example, receiving a fentanyl drip, if they're receiving linazolid, if they've been on Prozac or fluoxetine, excuse me, or, or citalopram or sertraline, these medications cause an interaction with the medication and cause serotonin syndrome. We do not want to cause our patients harm. In addition to that, there could be oximetry errors. This has to do with the actual blue dye, because at the end of the day, methylene blue is a dye, and it actually interferes with the pulse oxys. When I used to think I was smart, um, I used to say, hey, why don't you just check a blood gas and then you'll be able to fix this. But the reality is that some detectors for ABGs and such, they also work on this infrared sensor. So depending on your machine, this might not be accurate even under those circumstances. People who have underlying G6PD deficiency could develop a hemolytic anemia. So this is a patient population in which you don't want to give them methylene blue. And there's also this concern, especially with the first trials look, looking at methylene blue and sepsis, of pulmonary vasoconstriction taking place. So if you have a patient who has severe pulmonary hypertension, this is not the medication for them. One of the things that I'm discussing today, obviously, is methylene blue and septic shock, but I want to bring up the point that using methylene blue and septic shock is not new. There's studies back from 1995 
looking at methylene blue and septic shock. There were a couple RCTs that were performed, very small, of course, that were performed in the early 2000s, but nothing came out from them. I guess our interest went into different locations. Where we do have a robust amount of data on methylene blue is for patients who are suffering from cardiac surgery-related basoplegia. For those people who take care of cardiac surgery patients, you know, there are risk factors for developing this type of distributive shock, including long pump runs, including being on ACE inhibitors, ARBs, et cetera. This is a very challenging thing to take care of once you do have patients uh, who suffer from it. But usually these patients receive norepinephrine, vasopressin, and then we go down the pipeline to give them methylene blue. So we have a lot of experience with the adverse effects and all these things that I mentioned beforehand. This, for example, this was just last week. That's my thumb there on the, on the picture uh, because we gave methylene blue to a patient who was an end stage renal disease patient who took his ARB, even though we told him not to, he took his ARB before surgery because he's a good patient. But nonetheless, he, he did better. And the big trial that I'm going to be discussing today is the Shockham Blue trial. This trial was just 91 patients. It's not a big, huge study. It's not one of these 500 patient studies. But the people who conducted the study are out, out of Guadalajara, Mexico. And the, this team has published a lot of work in the past. They do a really good job. And what they did is that they randomized 91 patients as an RCT to either receive methylene blue or usual care. The interesting thing is that usual care, once they, once they started the methylene blue, patients were already on norepinephrine and vasopressin. So they were sick patients. These are not patients who are just like a little bit of levo and call it a day. But the interesting thing that took place in this, in this study was that 70 to 80 percent of patients were in ARDS. What did I say we had to worry about a little while ago? This pulmonary vasoconstriction, right? But these patients had ARDS. So what came from these data? Well, it was beneficial in that there was a faster discontinuation of the vasopressin of the vasopressors when the patients received methylene blue. So they received fewer catecholamines. From a financial perspective and from a workflow perspective and throughput perspective, there was a shorter ICU length of stay by about a day. That was the median difference between the two. In addition to that, there was a shorter hospital length of stay, which is something else that's beneficial for those of us who work our way into admin. These are things that we just look at. There was no mortality benefit, however. Um, but when you look at the data, 33% versus 46%, it just was empowered for a mortality benefit. No serious side effects came out of this study, so these are good things. Moving on to hydroxycobalamin, this is vitamin B12. It's one of the different serotypes of uh, vitamin B12. Same pathway we saw before. It knocks out the inducible uh, nitric oxide synthase and soluble guanylocyclase. But in addition to that, there's this other co compound which it knocks out as well, the hydrogen sulfide. This, you'll see abnormal labs. Your CBC might be off. Your hemoglobin, your glucose might be off. You're also going to see your creatinine be off, alkaline phosphatase. Your LFTs are going to be erroneous. Also, if you're looking at PTINR, that's all going to be erroneous as well. It's going to turn your urine red. It's going to make the patients have erythema in their body. It's going to look like they're having a rash. But just keep in mind that this goes away. It's auto-limited. Patients who are on hemodialysis, the red tinge is going to mess with the sensors on the dialysis, as well as some ECMO uh, sensors as well. So just keep that in mind. We have experience using this particular medication, hydroxycobalamin, in cardiac surgery-related basoplegia. So uh, a lot of us have experience using this, so we already are aware of the side effects. The study here that came out recently, uh, it was in February of this year, was the IV hydroxycobalamin and septic shock study. And this was a phase two study. It was a pilot study. Just 20, 20 patients were enrolled where they either received hydroxycobalamin or usual care. Now, 70% of these patients were on jet fuel, meaning that they were already on norepinephrine, they were already on vasopressin and epinephrine when they got the hydroxycobalamin. So, you know, mortality is pretty high on these patients already at baseline. But again, this was a pilot study, so they're trying to see if there's any adverse effects or how it could potentially help. And they only followed these patients for three hours, by the way. And what they found was a 36% reduction in the vasopressors at 30 minutes. And after three hours, there was a 26% reduction in the vasopressors in these patients. So you are seeing some catecholamine sparing of effects, of using hydroxycobalamin in patients with septic shock. The interesting thing is that all these lab abnormalities that you can see, the, they weren't seen in this actual study. But again, this was only 20 patients. This is a phase two study. We still have a lot to, a lot to look forward to. One of the key questions here that I look at any medication in my administrative position is, what's the cost of it? Is, it, is the benefit going to be worth the cost? And 
each one of them for, for the course of duration, basically a dose or two doses or so, is less than $1,000. It's around like 950. That's the average wholesale price that's listed on up to date as of like a week ago. So it's expensive, but it's something that we could potentially utilize for our patients who are in septic shock. What's next is the big question, right? Because these are small trials on a small subset of patients. I'm not saying that we need to go ahead and start using it today, but with studies that are currently listed on clinicaltrials.com, clinicaltrials.gov, we're seeing that there is some interest in looking down these different mechanisms as catecholamine sparing agents to help us in patients who are in septic shock. So that's my chat on methylene blue and hydroxycobalamin. Reach out to me if you guys have any questions or anything like that. Thank you all.